Good morning. We welcome you this second Sunday in Advent, and um, I want to bring some announcements to you, but uh, we're so pleased that we can come in anticipation of meeting with the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, um, thinking about uh, his first Advent, his first coming, uh, always looking forward to and thinking about his second Advent, his second coming. Uh, but what does it mean in between to meet with Jesus, to expect him, to encounter him? Uh, so we want to be uh, hopeful and expectant this morning. Uh, dear Lord, we do want our hearts to be, be prepared, be ready to meet you, uh, Lord, because we know you are ultimately faithful. You are faithful to want to, to meet with us, uh, for us to experience you, for us to know the joy of, of being with you, of spending time with you, of sensing your presence in, in and amongst us. And so, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have even this morning, uh, because we know that you are trustworthy in it. Uh, and so, Lord, it, in times when we don't feel you or feel close to you, uh, it, we know it's always because we're moving away or we're struggling with something. So, Lord, I just pray that we could, um, if, we, if we need to confess something even right now, if we need to repent of something even right now, but, Lord, we want to meet with you today. Um, and so, Lord, we just thank you for that opportunity. And, Lord, we just lift up uh, people in our congregation that are sick and, and, and need physical healing. Uh, Lord, we specifically lift up Mark Strauss as he's having eye surgery tomorrow. I just pray that you'd uh, be with him as he goes into that surgery. Help him to have a peace that comes from you. Help him not to be anxious. Um, but Lord, I just pray that you'd guide the hands of the surgeons, that everything would go well, and that it would be a great success f through this surgery. Lord, for, uh, for those of us who uh, struggle with maybe emotional pain during the holidays, uh, for whatever reason, for over a sense of loss, and Lord, we just lift them up to you, and, and Lord, we just know that, you'll, that you promise to be near those who are, are struggling emotionally, but I, I just pray that we as a congregation could be there to help lift people up as well. And, so, and Lord, I also know that there's people that are in some ways struggling spiritually, and Lord, I, I thank you that you are God who can bring healing. Uh, Lord, thank you that you um, meet with each and every one of us exactly where we are. You know our needs, and you're ready to meet our needs and to help us. Uh, and, and maybe the way you're going to help us is to just be there with us while we go through some struggles. And Lord, help us to be prepared for that, open to that. Uh, but Lord, constantly looking to you and keeping you as our focus, uh, as our focal point to move through this world uh, and move through this life. And Lord, thank you. Uh, that you promised us to walk with us every step of the way. Uh, we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
The song, in its simplest form, is a poem set to music. To have a song in your heart reflects an intense feeling of happiness and contentment. Spiritually, a song denotes a glorification of the Lord on account of liberation. We consider the songs of the book of Revelation, songs of the salvation orchestrated by God and his son. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. Songs sung to celebrate the forgiveness of sin and the gift of salvation offered to humanity. Over 2,000 years ago, John the Baptist's father was filled with the Holy Spirit to prophesy these words before John's birth, the words known as the Song of Zechariah. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and he has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those um, living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. A song of opportunity for freedom, singing of redemption and the swell of salvation being raised up. A song of the knowledge of salvation coming to the people of earth and a pathway for sins to be forgiven. Join with me in prayer. Redeeming God, as we remember and celebrate the arrival of your son, Jesus, to this world, we want to sing of your tender mercy to us. You have rescued us. You have raised up salvation for us. Enable us to serve you without fear in holiness and righteousness all our days. Shine your light on us and guide our feet into the path of peace. Praise be to the Lord. Amen. We invite you to rise and worship with us.
Thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to do this scripture reading for today. It's in Isaiah 49, 1 through 7. If you're using a pew Bible, it's on page 1138. We can open up your Bibles to Isaiah 49. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me like a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, he, was, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says. The Redeemer and the Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servants of rulers, kings will see you and rise up, princes will see and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. May God bless the reading of his word. Please rise and join us in singing.
Children's Church, grades kindergarten through second, can walk out and go to the elementary school classroom. I invite you to open your Bibles back up to Isaiah 49. I had other plans, and I didn't have much time to go through the craft show. I wish I had more time. There were so much neat things to look at and uh, um, people to talk to. It was, seemed like a really awesome event. Uh, I did have a couple opportunities to talk to different people. One of the people I talked to, as they were selling items, they, they said, uh, well, Mark, um, I'm having some neat opportunities to talk to people. Uh, I, I met some people that were new to the community, uh, hadn't been here very long. And I told them, you know, well, you're more than welcome to come to our church. Uh, we think it's a, a, a nice place. You might want to come check it out. And I've been talking to people uh, a little bit about spiritual things and about Jesus. And, and they kind of looked at me and was like, so I don't, I don't know if I'm doing anything or accomplishing anything, um, but I'm, I'm trying to be out here and be available. But isn't that how we often think, right? Like, here's what I'm doing. I don't, know, I don't know if I'm accomplishing anything or achieving anything. And, and no one's immune to it, right? I mean, uh, me as a pastor, we, I, I talk about my theology is that you have to have a calling to be a pastor. You don't just decide that's a vocation I want to uh, take on. Uh, you feel like the Lord's telling you this is what you should be doing. And you don't really have kind of a choice in the matter in a sense, you know. It's a calling. And there's days I say I'm exactly where God wants me to be. I feel like God is blessing and, um, you know, I, I can use my gifts here. And there's days when you go, man, maybe I'm not the right person for this situation. Or maybe my gifts and talents don't extend to what they need from me. Uh, or, you know, you know, you have those days where you go... Am I accomplishing what God wants me to? Am I the right person for the job? Okay, and, and we've, we all kind of feel that way at times. In different ways, in different settings, in different, comes out in different ways. And that's part of what they're talking about here. Um, and let's, let's uh, remind ourselves where we're coming from. And I, it's building, and I know I've been going out of order, so I threw you a curveball and I apologize. But in Isaiah 48, 16, the chapter that comes right before this, it said, come near me and listen to this. And then it, I'll skip a little part. And it says, and now the sovereign Lord has sent me with his spirit. And it's it reintroducing us to what's been the major uh, topic for several chapters now. The servant of the Lord. This capital S servant. This individual who's coming. And he says, listen to me. Because God is sending me. And he's sending me with his spirit. And that's who we pick up with here. So who is this servant? And you look at the passages and you say, well, is this person going to be, is it going to be a special prophet? Is it going to be a special priest? Is it going to be a special king? Or is it going to be all three? Right? As, and, and as we looked at the first song of the servant in Isaiah 42, he, he talked a lot about bringing justice to this world. And he talked a lot about spreading God's law a, 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 around the world. And it seems like it's talking about this guy who's going to be a come and be a special king. Kings establish law. Kings firm up justice. And now in this second servant song, it seems to emphasize his prophetic role. As you look through, as we read through this, and we're only going to do small sections of 49 for, for the rest of the month. As we're doing small sections, think about how he's, he's being called to be a special prophet. And we know that Jesus obviously was called to be a king and a priest and a prophet, and so he fulfills all those. But let's, let's look at verse 1 in this second servant song. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made, made mention of my name. Another way that, that was translated uh, in the new NIV is, and from my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. And from my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. But this, this section, verse 1 all the way to verse 6, it begins and ends with this idea that this is an important message for the whole world. So when he's trying to gather their attention, he says, he says islands, which we know that's the farthest out people you can imagine, and distant nations. He's saying this is a message for the whole world. And then when you, by the time you get to verse 6, 
He's saying, you're, look, you're going to be a light to the Gentiles. You're going to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. This message is for everybody. He, a lot of times he's kind of going, all right, Israel, I, I need to talk to you. I, I need to talk to you about Cyrus coming and rescuing you. But this is clearly for the whole world and not just limited to a tribe or the whole nation of Israel. It's not, it's not limited in that way. And, and this idea that he's been called into this role, into this purpose, before he was even born, is leaning into that idea of the prophet, right? Was what, remember what Jeremiah told us in Jeremiah 1, 4, and 5? He says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah the prophet, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. It's leaning into that role of prophet, of God saying, okay, I, I, I need to make sure from the womb on, that I'm going to call this person to a special mission, a special calling, to tell people the message of the Word of God. And we, we all know, I think, that this is a critical element of the Christmas story and the birth of Jesus Christ. It appears again and again throughout the Christmas story. This is an important idea that he's been called before birth, that his name is given. In the same way that they were celebrating the name of Cyrus being given because it shows specificity, he's saying, look, we keep naming these people. Uh, it starts with Zechariah, who we read about in the Advent reading today. It starts with John the Baptist, who is called before his birth with his name in Luke 1. It says, then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing, talking about Zechariah, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you are to call him what? John. I'm going to name him. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He, will never, he is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his, he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So very much in the mission, and we'll get to it like in verse 6, very much on mission, this servant is called to bring people back to the Lord. And he, God says, before you even have an opportunity to do that, I'm going to send a prophet before you who starts the job off, who starts calling people back into relationship with the Lord, who have drifted away. And then we know, of course, the story of Jesus in Luke 1. When angel Gabriel appears to Mary, he says, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you were to call him Jesus. He's been called before birth. He's been named before birth. His name literally means he saves, Savior. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And just so there's no lack of clarity to that the, this is right in the line with Isaiah 49 uh, in Matthew 1, God gave that same exact message to Joseph, didn't he? And after he considered this, considered what? Divorcing her quietly. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived is her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. We're calling him Jesus because he saves, because he saves. That calling before birth, that naming before birth, it's, it's spoken very clearly right here in Isaiah 49, 500 years before this, that stuff happens. What does it say in verse 2? He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me like a po into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. We know in Revelation it uses that same language about Jesus, that out of his mouth comes a sharpened sword. It's talking about that it, his words are like a sharpened sword or a polished arrow, meaning they're effective and they're powerful. And if we look at the ministry of Jesus, of course, what they say over and over again is his words are effective and they're powerful. And he's, he, he is like a sword and he's also like an arrow, meaning he's ready and prepared for any type of encounter that you may become part of. 
He was ready for anyone. He was ready for the down and outers. He was ready for the religious leaders who were haughty. He was ready to engage anyone on any topic and have the spirit and the words of God coming out of his mouth. He was ready for any kind of encounter that he would uh, come across. He was ready for the brokenhearted. He was ready for anyone he came into their circle. But what does it also say? It says he was hidden in the shadow of his hand and concealed in his quiver. It's that, it's that idea that even though we have these such clear messages about Jesus way before he ever came, it wasn't crystal clear until the right time. Even in his ministry on earth, Jesus said, let's not make this crystal clear quite yet because I don't want to get ahead of where God is taking us on this journey. So it's this idea that the, 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 the absolute facts about Jesus were hidden until the needful time, until the absolute right time. His, his purpose was concealed until the appropriate time. If the whole world knew his purpose was to come and die and shed his blood on the cross for our sins, then maybe that's exactly the opposite of what, where they would have taken him. But his, his, his purpose was concealed for a time. Even though with his disciples he said, I'm going I'm to go down to Jer Jerusalem, I'm gonna, uh, they're going to kill me but on the third day I'll rise again. So for a few, he would tell them, and he started making this message go out. Verse 3, he said to me, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. So here the servant is given a name, Israel. So some commentators look at this and say, oh, we see you guys have been misunderstanding this. This is not about Jesus. This is not about some future person, special person. He's talking to the nation of Israel. He just named it there. His name is Israel. Well, let's keep in mind a few things. I, I won't get long into this, but remember, the name Israel was for an individual first, right? Jacob's name was Israel, and then he became a nation. It was for an individual first. And to say, well, this is talking about the nation, that cannot be. Just go to verse 5 and 6 and reread them. What is the mission of this person? To bring back Jacob and Israel. So how would he say, Israel, you're going to bring back Israel? Okay, he's saying, I'm going to call you Israel, but I'm going to have you bring back the actual nation to me. Okay, and then the, the, thirdly, the phrase, display my splendor. Display my splendor is used 13 times in the Old Testament, nine times in the book of Isaiah. Every time it's, it's spoken, it's talking about God doing something himself. I'm going to display my splendor. I'm going to do something that only I can do. And so the servant's work is going to display God's splendor, meaning the servant's work is going to be a work that only God himself can do. And isn't that exactly what Jesus accomplished on the cross? It was only God the Son who could possibly die and cover the sins of the entire world. He's going to display his splendor, do something only God can do. And what, is, what does he start with at the very beginning? He says what? Listen to me. Listen to me. And just so, again, so there's New Testament, uh, making sure we get it, we catch it, we understand. Uh, in Mark 9, 7, when they're on the Mount of Transfiguration, when God himself ha takes the opportunity to speak a couple words about Jesus, what does he say? This is my son, whom I love. And then what does he say next? Listen to him. The same exact words spoken about the servant in Isaiah 49. Make sure you listen to him when you see him. Are the very words Jesus, God says, hey, listen, I'm going to speak into the world here. Listen to him. This is the servant. This is the guy from Isaiah 49. Listen to him. Same exact words. Why would God call Jesus Israel? And again, this could be a whole sermon all by itself, but let me quote uh, an author here. It says, the Messiah is called Israel because he fulfills what Israel should have done. In his person and work, he epitomizes the nation, embodies what Israel was called to be. Remember, right from the beginning, God says, hey, listen, walk with me, follow me, obey me, serve me, love me, make all the nations around you want me, let them come to you to seek my information about me, tell them about me, help them have a relationship with me, then I can be the God of this whole world. So be that for me. Did Israel do that well? No. So that, that, that plan wasn't something that Israel in their humanity and their sinfulness could fulfill. And then God said, you know what? I'm going to send my own son to do that. And he's going to relive the purpose of Israel to live perfectly in perfect obedience to God and perfect worship of God and call all men unto himself so that they can know him. 
so that he can be, have a relationship with them. And you, I'm going to use a big word, but you know, commentators talk about how Jesus, to make sure we all understood that, Jesus re- recapitulates the, the, the history of Israel with his very life. Right? There's hints of it all over. I won't get into all of them. But t- so, God, so you know that Jesus is living out the life that Israel could have and should have lived out. Um, when he's born, what's the very next thing he does? He, get, he goes off into Egypt, right, to hide for a time. What did Israel do after their nation was born? During a famine, they went down into Egypt for hide for a time. Okay, And then once they came out of Egypt, what did they do? They passed through the Red Sea. And when Jesus wanted to start his ministry, what did he do? He got baptized. He passed through the water. And then, and then as he was kicking off his ministry, Israel wandered through the wilderness for 40, 40 years. And what did Jesus do? He wandered into the wilderness for 40 years. But he did it differently. 40 days. Sorry, 40 days. He did it differently, didn't he? When, when Israel was wandering through the wilderness, they kept saying, they kept saying no to God and yes to, to Satan and the demons. And they said, sure, we'll worship a golden calf. And yes, we don't trust God. And what did Jesus do when he was in the wilderness? He said no to Satan and he said no to temptation. He said yes to God. He did it differently. He did it the right way. He relived Israel's history in the right way. Uh, we could go on with recapitulation, but that, that gets you the idea of where we're going. So when God says, my servant is, I'm going to name him Israel. Because he's going to fulfill my dreams for Israel. And then in verse 4, verse 4, there's this incredible change of tone and a revelation about the future ministry of Jesus. But he said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is from my God. So we, we've established that this servant spoken about, prophesied about, is, is born as Jesus. And his feeling or impression at some points in his life here on earth will be that his labor had no purpose, that he had spent his strength in vain, and that his efforts were all for nothing. Now you might say, Pastor, come on. Now, we feel that way at times. We all feel that way at times. But are you saying Jesus felt that same way? Well, remember what it says in Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. And I would say one of our big weaknesses is that we are not sure that we're kingdom builders, that we're properly serving the Lord. He can sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet was without sin. He was tempted in every way. So if we're tempted to think that we're not really accomplishing anything for the Lord, Jesus was, accom- was tempted with feeling like he wasn't accomplishing it, what the Lord had for him. When you start thinking about the feelings of potential failure in the ministry of Jesus, you, get, you can get a pretty long list. In Luke 7... John the Baptist, we were talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was in prison. He, he got the authorities mad at him. He's in prison, and he sent men. And when the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to, to you to ask, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Can you imagine how deflating that would be for Jesus? For the man called before birth, named before birth, set up to pr- announce the coming of Jesus. The man who stood there with every bit of confidence when he walked across his, uh, his uh, viewpoint, he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus is like, yes, he's announcing me. Yes, someone here believes in me and who I am. My brothers don't believe, my sisters don't believe, but he believes He says, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. He even gets it. He gets that, yes, I was born in the incarnation as a human, but I've existed since eternity past. I'm God in human flesh. He gets it. He surpasses me because he came before me. He says, the reason I have come was that he might be revealed to Israel. John said, the whole reason for my existence, my main point of living life, is to make sure people know that Jesus is the Messiah. And now that person is going, so are you the Messiah or not? 
Can you imagine how you feel when you hear that? You go, oh, maybe nobody gets it. The guy whose job was to get it and to announce it doesn't get it. He still thinks we might be looking for another Messiah. What should I have done for poor John to make him not go to that place? Think about as he meets with religious leaders, the people who have Isaiah 49, and could go, oh, th this is you, right? Should we, should we announce it at the temple like tomorrow? Or what do you want to do, Jesus? What is he doing with those religious leaders? Constant arguments, constant disbelief, constant demanding of miracles and whatnot. These people that should have recognized and promoted him are his main opponents in his whole ministry. And we see, you know, I mean, look, look what he's called to. He's called to call Israel back to, to God. And what happened over the course of his 33 years on earth and three years of ministry? Israel did not, as a whole, return in repentance and love to the Lord. As a matter of fact, John 1, 11, before John even tells the gospel story, he starts with, he came to that which was his own, meaning the Jewish people, and his own did not receive him. Just so you know, spoiler alert, yeah, they, they don't all come to believe in Jesus. Luke 8, 25, he's on a boat with his disciples. There's a storm up, and what is, he wakes up, and what does he say? They say, Jesus, we're going to die. He says, where's your faith? Where's your faith? Have, haven't you got to know me at all? Like, you guys walk with me every day, and you think we're going to die because of a storm? You think the Son of God is going to die because of a storm? Where's your faith? That's, that's ministry for, for Jesus. You think he didn't struggle with feeling like sometimes I'm a failure? There were, in Mark 8.21, he's, he's asking them about the loaves and the fish. And he says, do you still not understand? How many did you collect? Oh, we collected seven baskets. Okay, great. You got the facts down. Don't you understand? Don't you understand all that I'm trying to show you? I'm trying to show you I have control over creation. Don't you understand what I'm trying to say, say to you guys? And these are the ones closest to him. Famously in Luke 9, 41. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you and put up with you? God, this is, this is my job? Like, my job is to show myself for who I am, to say, you know, his culminating thing is make sure you believe on me and you can have eternal life. Make me a part of you. I'm the bread of life. Take me into you and you can have eternal life. And he's like, they don't get any of it. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And when he actually told them that he's the bread of life and they need to take him in, they need to eat him and drink his blood, it's tough teaching for people. And John 6 tells us from that time many of his disciples turned back. So even there was a time when there, the people were thronging to him. And you would say, okay, this ministry is really taking off. I'm really, I'm really reaching people. People are really being convinced. I'm changing hearts and minds. And then he says, you've got to eat, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And it says from this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And listen to the emotion when he turns to his 12. What does he say to them? You do not want to leave too, do you? You do not want to leave too, do you? What is he thinking during the abandonment of his disciples, during the mockery, during the beatings of the trial, during the flogging, during that moment when he heard one of his closest disciples deny him three times? You've got to be thinking, is this all in vain? Is this all for something? Those hours on the cry cross, feeling his life slip away, the temptation to think, have I accomplished anything? But that verse never leaves Jesus there, does it? Even before the sentence is finished, it's already turning to a rallying point. And Jesus is saying, all my work, all my efforts, all my labor for the Lord 
when it has been he who calls me to it is all in his hands. That's immediately what he says. He says, this is what you're tempted to think. This is the thoughts that flash across your head. But he says, but what, what I come down on is yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand. If God called me to it, it's in his hands. I'm not going to think it's pointless. I'm not going to think it's meaningless. I'm not going to think it's not worthwhile. My reward is from my God. Jesus understood, absolutely, and it's the same thing for us. The keys are our faithfulness to what he calls us to do, our obedience to what he calls us to do, and our trust in him in the midst of it. It's the same is true for us. It was true for the servant. That's true for Jesus. And we, we think the same things. We're tempted to think the same things. And I am making any dent at all for the kingdom of God. Am I impacting anyone? Am I being a blessing every day? Am I making a difference in this world? When it's for the Lord, the rewards are in, the results are in his hands. That's what Jesus had to believe. That's what we have to believe. When it's for the Lord, your reward is with him. So even if you see no reward that you think you should see, it is in his hands. It's with him. Verses 5 and 6. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. See, the servant, and see, people might misunderstand this, the servant was chosen to bring back Jacob and Israel, not from Babylon. Some people read this whole thing and go, see, he's talking about the servant, uh, Cyrus, bringing them back from Babylon. Haven't we established it's so much bigger than that? Servant is chosen to bring this nation back from alienation from God. And Paul looks forward to that day and celebrates that day in Romans 11. He says, that, that hasn't happened yet, but it's coming. When God makes a promise, it's coming. The servant is bringing Jacob and Israel back to himself. It's going to happen in a major way. It's going to happen in a miraculous way. It's going to happen in God displaying his splendor sort of way. Only God can do it sort of way. But, he's, but God says, you know what? Even that, even that would be too small. Even that is too small for my son. Even that is too small for this level of sacrifice. It can't be just spiritually bringing Israel to a knowledge of God in a special way. He says that's too small. <clears throat> See, Israel had the light of God's word and God's presence in their midst. They had the temple. They had the presence of God. They had all these attributes, but what they needed was restoration. And isn't that what John the Baptist was called to start, start the restoration. And Jesus was supposed to finish it, start, finish the restoration. And that's still coming. But he says the Gentiles, they need the light of God's plan for humanity because they know nothing. That was us. They knew nothing about God's plan. They need salvation that only Jesus can bring. They needed it all. And he says, that's too small, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you be a light for the Gentiles and, and teach them all your message of salvation, bring salvation to all of them. See, and the Hebrew word there, it's, it's, it, it's amazing. Just think this through. Think through what God can do through his word. Okay, it, it, that line where it says, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. And the Hebrew word, and you look, every translation is slightly different, different translations of the Bible. The Hebrew word either means to come to pass, or it means to be, to be something. So let's translate it a couple different ways, okay, based on the meaning of the Hebrew word. Uh, so it could mean the servant is called to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. It could be that the servant is called to be salvation to the ends of the earth. Or it could be that the servant will enable salvation to reach to the ends of the earth. They're all true. They're all true. God, through his Holy Spirit, and had Isaiah write down a Hebrew word for every one of them is true. He's the one who is salvation for the whole world. He's the one who brings salvation to the whole world. He's the one who enables salvation to reach to the whole world. He does it all. And it's all in that verb. All true. And in, in Acts 13, 47, Paul and Barnabas, they, they use Isaiah 49, 6 
and they apply it to all followers of Jesus. They say, hey, look, why are you out here preaching? We're out here because, God, you made us a light for the Gentiles that we may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. That's how they answer the authorities, is this verse. They apply it to all followers of Jesus. Because remember what Jesus did when he left? He said, I did my peace. Now part of my peace is leaving so the Holy Spirit can come into all of you so you can continue this mission to reach the whole world for, with salvation. Go do it. So what's the future here? Verse 7. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servants of, servant of rulers. Kings will see you and rise up. Princes will see and bow down. Because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. This is the Lord's word to the Redeemer. And, I mean, think about how absolutely dead on this is. At a certain point, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, is going to be despised and abhorred by the very nation you came to save. Isn't that what happened? I mean, strong language. Despise them and abhor. Yes. They said, you have an opportunity to free somebody. Do you want to free Jesus? They said, no. We want to fill, uh, Barabbas, free Barabbas. Whatever you do, make sure you kill this Jesus. We all hate him. You're going to be despised and abhorred by the very nation you came to save. But Jesus, you're going to serve them anyway because you know when God's in it, it's for a purpose. When God calls you to it, there's going to be a reward for it. He knew that the reward was in God's hands. And he says, but you know what's going to happen? One day, even princes and kings are going to see you and bow down to you. And Paul knew his, one of his missions was to tell kings about Jesus. That was already happening in the life of Paul. By the time you get to A.D. 301, A.D. 301, the king of Armenia declares that we have, this is a Christian nation. He says, I want to say that this, I want, I want my kingdom, because I'm a Christian, I want this whole kingdom to be run by Christian principles. 301, A.D., first Christian nation established. Kings and priests are seeing Jesus and bowing down to him. And you can get early, it's already early 1300s where you have Constantine and some of the stuff that came out of some of that stuff, we, you know, we can debate it, but he's, you know, he's called the first Christian emperor and that's in like the 320s. Up until the point, and ever since then, we've had rulers and kings and authorities. It's not just, yes, most of the time it's often people that know they need a savior who come to Jesus, but all the up, it's, it's, it's powerful people who see and bow down to Jesus. That, that prophecy has absolutely come true. And we know at the second advent of Jesus in Philippians 2, we read that every person is going to see and bow down to Jesus. So that's his future. So in the moments when he's tempted to feel like, is any of this achieving something? You look to your future because he knows, what does it say? Two things. He knows that the Lord is faithful to his chosen servants. He's like, if you call me to this, you're going to be faithful in this. You're going to achieve all of this, God. I, I totally get that. And he says, and because you've chosen me. You've chosen me. You've put me on this path. you put me on this journey. It's obviously for a purpose. And here's the thing for us. You know, each, each week we're talking about some aspect of salvation. And, and this one, this sermon's entitled, Bring My Salvation. Is it okay for us to think about, maybe that's the salvation we need today? That's the salvation we need in our life? Is it okay for us to pray that the Lord would bring to us the salvation of knowing that our efforts for him are in his hands and the rewards are from him. I, be, I really believe there's people in this building who that's the prayer you need to pray right now. Lord, bring me the salvation, the freedom, the liberation of knowing that my efforts for your, for your kingdom, for your righteousness, for your son Jesus Christ, who I love with my whole heart, but my efforts for him are in your hands and the rewards are from you. One last thought as we close. Work to which God has called us can never be a failure. Work to which God has called us can never be a failure. As, we, uh, as the choir comes up to sing our last song, think about it. Infant, holy, infant, lowly. Uh, that idea, we talked a lot about that lowly feeling that you can have. Now, 
Um, you know, we understand that Jesus struggled with that. Um, the one line in, in the, I think it was the first song we sang, Come, O Come, Emmanuel, so many powerful lines in that. But he talks about that often we're in a lonely exile until the Son of God appears. That was true of the nation of Israel, but sometimes it's, it's true of us in some ways, that we kind of feel sometimes like we're in some kind of lonely exile until the Son of God really appears in our lives and lets us know, you're not in exile, I'm right here with you. So let's stand and sing. <clears throat> you all to join us in the fellowship hall after the service for some refreshments go through this door and make a left when you go down the stairs if stairs are difficult for you we have a lift and we have it for a reason so uh it's a it's not doesn't work the same as an elevator somebody will help you uh somebody go over there and make sure you're there at the um lift so that w they can be helped for sure um and so go that way or if you're going to go this way that's where you would go to sign up to ring bells for the uh Salvation Army, I forgot to announce that, but bell ringing on the 18th, if you want to help us fill it in that day, uh, that's where you would go back there. All right, let's pray. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Amen.